Of course, women must earn less than men because they are weaker, they are smaller, they are less intelligent, and they must earn less. That's all. Mr. Deputy, according to you and your theories, I don't have the right to be a deputy. And I know it bothers you and that you regret that today women are able to represent citizens just as you are. I personally am here to protect women from men like you. For many men, professional equality and parity are still considered to be four-letter words. How can you talk about 70 years of emancipation and still call us the weaker sex? It's unbelievable. Subconsciously or not, many men find it hard to accept that women are their professional equals. Let's not forget that we're asking men, who for so long have been on the highest branch of the most beautiful tree in the forest, with the finest view to the savannah, to cut the branch or to share it. These guys simply say, no way. But things are gradually changing. Companies are beginning to acknowledge the benefits of gender diversity. We know there's a very high correlation when there are three or more women on the top management team with the financial performance of the company. Because most families can hardly do without two salaries now, it is time to demonstrate maturity and invent harmonious equality for the benefit of both women and men. I fully understand how unsettling it can be to have a newcomer demanding a piece of pie that was never shared previously. But I do think it's a shame that there's not a more constructive debate regarding the issue of, you know, what can you gain without me losing anything? For centuries, power was masculine. While a few female pioneers managed to break the hegemony, Many had to do so incognito. Let me take you back to the 60s. Women were very much second-class citizens. And the idea of a woman setting up a serious business like a computer company was very... Well, people laughed at me. Stephanie Shirley was one of them. In 1962, from her home in the English countryside, this mathematician decided to create her own software business. But she quickly realized that being a woman was a problem. I was launching out dozens of letters introducing my company's services to potential customers. And I signed them, Stephanie Shirley. And they got no result whatsoever. And I started writing my letters and signing them, Steve Shirley. And one or two people responded. The male pseudonym opened doors. Her company developed around a new concept, employing educated mothers who were usually considered unemployable. And this is how Penny Tut joined the firm. I was an air hostess. Um, with British Airways, it was a wonderful job. But we weren't allowed to be married in those days. So, because I was getting married, I left BA and I had two children. And when the kids went to school, I decided I'd like to start being Penny again rather than just Mum. And that's where Steve's company was simply superb because it gave us the opportunity to get back into work, working from home. Stephanie, or Steve, enabled these mothers to reconcile family life and professional ambition she invented telework 40 years ahead of its time. There was no internet, even the telecommunications uh, was basic. We used to ask potential applicants, do you have access to a telephone? And from their homes, these women created softwares with just a pencil and paper. They designed systems for stock management or train dispatch, that were then encoded and implemented in a computer center. Ailsa Turner was our driver, and she used to go with her baby in the back of the car and my son in the back of the car. We would drive to the computer center, and she would basically babysit 
while I went in for 20 minutes. Because we were all women, we helped each other and we made sure that what was visible externally was professional. We were able to find the technicians that we needed because so many of them were highly qualified systems analysts or programmers who could no longer work because they had children. These women revolutionized society's codes, hidden in plain sight. Some worked in their bedrooms. They had a sort of study table there. One worked underneath the stairs of the house where there was a little cubby hole. There was one at five o'clock. She would tidy up all her workplace. And I think as far as her husband knew, she had a little part-time job. In fact, she was working at a corporate level. So it was all sort of a little bit disguised. The company developed increasingly sophisticated softwares and enjoyed tremendous success. We could do anything that we wanted to if we were prepared to work hard for it. And we did. We did the black box flight recorder for supersonic Concorde. We did all sorts of interesting things. In 1975, however, Stephanie Shirley faced unexpected turmoil when the British Parliament enacted a law banning sexual discrimination. Of her 300 employees, only three were male, and in the name of gender equality, she was forced to hire men. Well, the first few men that came in were all the wrong sort. They came in because they wanted to be surrounded by 300, you know, professional, qualified, bright women. It was just disaster. We eventually learnt how to um, recruit men. And we were one of the very few companies who offered equal opportunities to men. <laughs> the adventure did not end there. In 1981, Stephanie Shirley decided to open the capital to her staff. I think it's right and proper to share the risks, as we do, but also share the rewards. So I'd modelled on a co-ownership organisation here in Britain and 70 of my colleagues are now millionaires. And I'm very proud of that. In 2001, Stephanie Shirley was named Dame Commander by Queen Elizabeth II. At 83, she remains a role model for women in business. You can always tell ambitious women by the shape of our heads. They're flat on top for being patted patronizingly. <laughs> There's nothing legally holding women back today. And the complaints that I hear from young women are just so trivial compared to 50 years ago. There is no reason why any woman in Europe should, should have any difficulty with business. It's all in the mind. If you think you can't do it, you won't. If you believe that you can, you will. Everything is possible, but gender equality laws are rarely enforced and inequalities remain. There's a sort of wide gap between public policy that is gradually coming around to the idea that women are the equal of men and the fact that a number of archaic minds perpetuate sexual stereotypes and grant women only minimal legitimacy. As a result, in Europe, a woman earns 16.7% less than a man. It is even worse on the global level, with women earning 23% less than men. These inequalities are the result of centuries of male supremacy. And with the enactment of equal rights laws, the face of oppression of women is changing. Male domination has become more insidious and remains pervasive in the way women are talked about and represented. There are degrading cliches all over, in advertising and in many other media. Two stereotypes emerge from this flow of degrading images. 
both of which are very damaging, to say the least. In the end, women are the only discriminated group with a dual image, a positive one, the protective image of motherhood, and the negative one, the seducer, the whore. And this dual image subconsciously comes into play in the workplace and perverts male-female relationships. In France, 20% of women are sexually harassed in the course of their professional career. 80% of salaried women are regularly faced with sexist behavior. And no class is spared. Sexism at work, a dirty word that nobody wants but that should be discussed openly, is an ideology built around male superiority that leads to a series of acts, behaviors and attitudes which in the long run belittle and destabilize women in the work market, even to the point of self-censorship. Therefore, sexism slows down the progress of policies dealing with gender equality. Dr. Claire Gibault's deep passion for music has enabled her to overcome the constraints of sexism. She has made a place for herself in a hostile environment. When I was much younger, my body was the main topic of conversation. At one point in my life, I would wear only black, oversized outfits because I didn't want to be considered a sex symbol. I wanted to be a creative female musician. In the 1960s, it was almost impossible for a woman to conduct an orchestra. There is a strong myth surrounding an orchestra conductor, a myth of power, a myth of virility, a myth of genius. There is an entire scenario created for the entrance of the maestro on stage. But if a woman steps on stage, it means that it is not that much difficult or extraordinary. And so male maestros felt I was demystifying things. One remaining obstacle was to give women positions of responsibility. A strong women's movement emerged and fought for blind auditions, auditions held behind a screen, and in these cases, women reached finals. In this predominantly male world, women have had to elbow their way through in order to be respected. And to impose herself as a female conductor, Claire has had to forge her own authority. My only role models were male maestros who were often strongly hierarchical, sometimes haughty and disdainful with musicians. And when I, as a woman, tried to do the same, it didn't work. I soon realized that something else was expected of a woman and that they couldn't accept being constrained. Claire Gibault traveled the world from one opera house to the next for 20 years, supported by her mentor, Claudio Abbado. Then she returned to France, committed to spread her own wings. I couldn't break through the gas ceiling. In France, I applied for conducting positions, even for small orchestras, and would not even receive a reply. I couldn't even get my résumé past the first round. In 2004, she abandoned music for politics and began a five-year term as European Parliamentary Deputy. There, she fought against female discrimination in the entertainment business. Monsieur le Président, Mr. President, fellow deputies, artistic careers have been stifled by the persistence of deep-rooted inequalities between men and women. Claire's parliamentary experience provided her with the tools to relaunch her musical career. Anywhere in Europe, for a woman to handle the position of musical or artistic director in a cultural institution, she must create her own entity. 
because nobody will seek her out. And so I realized that I needed to create my own orchestra. In 2011, Claire founded the Paris Mozart Orchestra, meant to be a model of fairness and tolerance, the opposite of what she had experienced in her debut. To begin with, Claire and her musicians are all considered equals. It's important for our group to have equal salaries, because in some cases, conductors in one evening make as much as the entire orchestra put together. And even if it's a renowned maestro with great ideas, I don't think it's necessarily always justified. Claire's musicians sign a non-discriminatory charter and select their future colleagues together. According to a basic rule, an equal number of women and men. We call in people we like, people who we want to work with. That's not the case with symphony orchestras where musicians are selected through auditions. And so the atmosphere is friendly. We all get along. With an orchestra made to measure, Claire can conduct as she pleases. Her motto? Shared authority. Any musician, be they soloist, cello soloist, or back row violist, can speak up and say, I think that such set of instruments are a bit too loud and the music isn't homogeneous, and everyone takes it into account. What's special about the way Claire works is that she never raises her voice. She's got enough character to get what she wants, but always in a gentle manner. What's fantastic is the musicians' deep involvement because it is their project as much as it is mine. To achieve fulfillment in her work, Claire Gibault, like Dame Stephanie Shirley, has invented her own professional framework. However, the vast majority of women is confronted to a blind corporate world that was not created for them. Businesses still find it difficult to open up positions of responsibility to women even when they are more qualified than men. Today, there are more and more female undergraduates with honorable mentions pursuing higher education. 50% of women in business schools, an exponential rise of women in engineering schools, and more than 60% in universities, etc., etc. So the problem is not about recruiting women. It's about recruiting talents, amongst whom there are logically more and more women. OK, now, Walt, you've had your little joke. Give her to somebody else. I ask for a man. We don't have a man with her qualification. I don't know. A company that doesn't see this is self-destructive and automatically deprives itself of talented people. As with many professional fields, space is gradually reaching out for female talents. Since the conquest of space began, 488 men have been launched into the cosmos, but only 60 women. Italian astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti points out that still today, women are very underrepresented. I understand that uh, being one of the few women astronauts in uh, Europe and currently the only active one, for a lot of young women, I am a kind of a role model, um, especially for those who aspire to pursue careers in aerospace or in general in, uh, in science and technology. And uh, of course, I see that as a uh, privilege and in a way, a responsibility. The women are still few in space, 
there can be no sexism because the priorities are safety and effectiveness. For us in here, it would not be reasonable to have sexism because we work on quality and doing something wrong will have large consequences. So sexism in here, in, in this environment, is not, it's counterproductive. To avoid all forms of discrimination, Italian Loredana Bessone teaches future astronauts to live and work together under extreme conditions. Coming from all corners of the world, they must learn to overcome cultural barriers and preconceived notions of gender. The more you are spending time with somebody of a different culture, whichever that culture is, could be gender, could be educational culture, the more you appreciate the differences and the more you speak the same language. So we call this a space culture. All the astronauts now leave the space culture and they feel like they belong to a group of spacefarers. And by then, you go totally out of your conventional thinking of cultures as differences. In orbit about 350 kilometers from Earth, the International Space Station is the largest and most complex object ever sent into outer space. Six astronauts, including one or two women, live there permanently for the purpose of scientific research. In Cologne, Germany, a team of flight controllers and engineers supervise the operations 24-7. The hardware is ready to support um, procession as confirmed. That. For these highly technical professions, ESA recruits exceptionally talented people. Throughout her years of study, Australian Andrea Boyd had just one objective in mind, space. Today, she is in charge of communication with the astronauts. We are ready to proceed with the first airway monitoring procedure. We are able to start when you're ready. And uh, do you have any questions for us this morning? I always wanted to work in space and specifically actually in mission control for the space station. That was kind of my dream. It was being built when I was in primary school and I saw it being built and thought it would be the most amazing project to work on. Um, as a kid in Australia, we didn't really have a space industry at all, but I, I figured if I studied engineering, I'd figure out a way to get there. Um, during my studies, and I did, so I've been working here for quite a few years now. Behind her control screens, Andrea keeps an eye on everything. The six astronauts have to live together in a very confined space and at the same time carry out scientific experiments, as well as manage their daily tasks. The tasks there are split up between whoever's on station, there's no regard to gender. Everyone has a very similar attitude, so, you know, you might have a terrible day, maybe you're your cousin died or something, but you doesn't, you've got to focus on work for that day regardless. Working in this very masculine environment hasn't prevented Samantha Cristoforetti, a former fighter pilot, from leaving her true passion. This carriage is moving, seven centimeters. See it moving, 13, 12, 13. I got 18 centimeters. And she's coming up. Wow. Imagine that. This was in outer space just... Just minutes ago. ago yeah. What does space smell like? Whoa. <laughs> Is that good? Samantha Cristoforetti of the European Space Agency, now inside uh, the Soyuz spacecraft that will be back in the Earth's atmosphere a short time from now. Women are just as professional as men. Where then do these inequalities come from? And why do they endure in the professional environment? A woman's diploma is worth less than a man's because it's not seen as a diploma. It's a valid degree, of course, but the woman is seen as coming with children and babies. She's like a soldier who is being held up, whereas a man is seen as independent and ready to be exploited.
very little has changed in 50 years and maternity is still at the heart of the problem. For men, children play the role of a transparent climbing escalator. The more children they have, the more responsibilities and promotions they get. Look at the many CEOs with five or six children. For women, children are a down escalator. The more children they have, the more they're considered less motivated, less capable, held up from their job.